From the heartland of America to every nation on earth, this is Jack Van Empe Presents The Truth in News and Commentary. Here now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empe. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our blessed Heavenly Father, as we proclaim the message of the new birth to the people of America, we pray that hearts may be stirred. Lord, for that one who's never been born again, for that one who's not saved, may this be the hour of beginning in their lives. In Jesus' name we ask it and for his sake, amen. amen. What is this strange terminology, the new birth? Our president claims to be born again. We believe he is. Millions in a recent Gallup poll said, we are born again Christians. Now, what is it? Some think that it's reincarnation. In fact, there was a man in the days of Jesus Christ by the name of Nicodemus who thought that. He came to Jesus by night under the cover of darkness. He didn't want anyone to know that he might even be contemplating Jesus Christ as Savior. And so he tried to do it in mysterious darkness. And he said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Imagine this intellectual leader in Israel said, Do I have to go back to infancy and then be reborn out of my mother's womb, a second fleshly birth? Jesus said, no, it has nothing to do with a fleshly birth, for that which is of the flesh is flesh, and that which is of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not. Don't be shocked that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And the word again in the Greek is anathen, born from above, born spiritually, born of God by the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with the flesh. Now, there are those today who say, well, I believe that when one dies, he returns in the form of another human or as a cow, a dog, a flea, or an ant. So don't step on an ant. It might be your ant. Wow. <laughs> I don't accept reincarnation for one moment, but I heard about a fellow who did, and he was married to a nagging woman. He couldn't take it. He longed to die, and finally his wishes were fulfilled. He died, she died. He returned as a dog, and she as a flea. <laughs> Aren't you glad you don't believe in reincarnation? <laughs> well, don't worry about it, for in the very text where Jesus Christ said, you must be born again, he said, it's not of the flesh, it's of the Spirit. It's from above. What is the new birth then? The simplest definition I could give you is this. It is a birth in the God's family produced by the Holy Spirit the moment one receives Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. I repeat that. It is a birth in the God's family produced by the Holy Spirit the moment, instantaneously, immediately, the moment one receives Jesus. Let me prove that. How many sons and daughters do we have in this audience tonight? Raise your hand high if you're a son or daughter. I wonder what the rest of you are. <laughs> I don't care if you're 90 years of age, you are someone's son or daughter. How did you become a son or daughter? By birth. No one can become a son or daughter in this world without being born into the world. It's just that simple. Now, let's make a few analogies. Just like it takes a physical birth to walk and live on earth, so it takes a second birth, a spiritual birth, to walk and talk in heaven for eternity. Just like you had nothing to do with your physical birth, an act of love between two parents produced it, 
so you have nothing to do with your second birth. An act of love when Jesus Christ died at Calvary 1900 years ago, shedding his precious, efficacious, holy blood provides for your born again experience. Just like a child receives the gift of life when he's born, so you can receive the gift of eternal life when you are born again by receiving Jesus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make it dogmatically and emphatically clear from the Holy Bible, for this is God's standard, that there is no other way to be born again but by receiving Jesus. We've already shown that human beings are sons and daughters by birth. No one is God's son or daughter without a second birth. John 1.12 says, as many as received Jesus, not to as many as were confirmed, catechized, simonized, galvanized, religiously porcelainized. We've got everything today in our churches. But to as many as received Jesus, to them gave he power to become sons and daughters of God. What does that say in all of its simplicity? When one comes to the foot of the cross, sees the shed blood of Jesus flowing down that cross, says, I believe that was for me. It's the blood that makes redemption for the soul, Ephesians 1, 7. We're redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus, 1 Peter 1, 19. Unto Christ who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1, 5. When one sees that truth and then receives that Jesus immediately, a birth takes place. Immediately, one becomes a son or daughter. Now, we have in America, every year, what is called the Fatherhood of God and Brotherhood of Man Week, and the clergymen stand in their pulpits and say, we are all the children of God. Well, that sounds good, but it isn't in the Bible. For Jesus said, and he's the greatest authority, he was God in the flesh, you are of your father, the devil, John 8, 44. 1 John 3, 10 states, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Two groups, children of God, children of the devil. And who's who? Whosoever practiseth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. You see, no one has the right to pray, Matthew 6, 9, my Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, until he has been born into the family of God. And that birth takes place exclusively as one receives Jesus. There is no other way to become born again. What does it say? As many as received Jesus. To them, the receivers of Jesus gave you power to become sons and daughters of God. A birth produces sons and daughters on earth. A second birth produces sons and daughters of God. And I say it repeatedly for repetition as a good teacher. That birth takes place through Jesus. These same clergymen who cry out, we are all the children of God, even quote Galatians 3.26 to do it. But you know, one can prove anything with half a verse. When a verse is taken out of context, it becomes a pretext. Here's what the whole verse says, Galatians 3.26, you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You leave Jesus out, you've got nothing. Now, when he comes in, life, abundant life, eternal life begins. You cannot get this life through meritorious service. You cannot get it by the works of the flesh. You cannot strive to be born again. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. How many folks egotistically, arrogantly, conceitedly say, I'm working my way to heaven. Well, then you'll never get there. Why? God gave eternal life as a gift through Jesus. Without Jesus, you'll never see the pearly gates. Now watch this. I love to bombard people with the truth. I will not make a statement on my own. Every word I'm about to utter is God's word. And notice that everything having to do with life is through Jesus. Because the birth is in Jesus, so the eternal life is also in Jesus. In Christ was life, John 1, 4. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Jesus said in John 5, 40, you will not come to me that you might have life. John 6, 47, Christ again speaking, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. John 10, 10, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to ste kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. John 10, 27. Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? There is no other way to God the Father but by Jesus Christ. And if you've not come through Jesus Christ, you do not have life, abundant life, eternal life. If you do not have Jesus Christ, you're lost. Could anything be plainer than 1 John 5, 12? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Oh, but I've been confirmed. I'm doing the best I can. Ah, but he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Oh, but I'm following the Sermon on the Mount, the Golden Rule, and the Ten Commandments. Ah, but he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Friends, Christianity is summed up in three words. Christ in you, Colossians 1.27. Paul could say in Galatians 2.20, Christ liveth in me. And all the meritorious service and all that men try to do is of the flesh. And Jesus said the new birth has nothing to do with the flesh. It is a birth from above, from heaven, by the Holy Spirit of God as one receives Jesus Christ. Who needs to be born again? Every member of the human race. We've got a lot of people like the Pharisee in the temple. And how Jesus despised this attitude. It was the Savior who preached about him, Luke 18, 10. He said two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisees were the strict religionists of the day. Why, they were so good that when they prayed, they even had to tell God how good they were. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as that crummy sinner over there, the publican. I fast twice in the week. Pretty good, huh, God? I give tithes of all that I possess. Jesus, disgusted with that attitude, turns our attention to the publican. They were tax collectors, and anything they could get above a certain amount they put in their own pockets. This man is so ashamed of his sin, so ashamed of his thievery, that he won't even look to heaven, but beats on his breast saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, that sinner went home justified, went home right with God, rather than the egotistical church member who thought he was so good he didn't need the blood of Jesus to be applied. And there are multitudes throughout America who are church members of every stripe and label, and yet you've missed it. It's Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Savior of the world. I preached a series on world radio, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. I read the New Testament through in a week's time. I circled every verse that says Jesus is the only way. 400 times I found it. Another 700 verses said it's the blood the blood of Christ that saves. 700 and 400 totals, 1,100 verses. If God said it once, I'd believe it. But when our God says it 1,100 times, we'd better believe it. All right, you say, what is the new birth then? It is simply coming to the cross, seeing that the blood has been shed for sinners. It's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul, Leviticus 17, 11. Without shedding of blood is no remission of sins, Hebrews 9, 22. And then saying, Lord Jesus, I believe that thy shed blood was for me. I receive you. And when Christ Jesus comes in, immediately one becomes born again. We've got so many mystical ideas floating around. The Bible says, as many as receive Jesus, to them gave he power to become sons. Why do we have to be born again then? We're all sinners. But the Pharisee wouldn't recognize it. And some of you say, well, I'm not so bad. I've never robbed or raped. I've never looted. I've never committed premarital sex. I haven't been involved in some of these horrendous, vile, lewd, licentious things of the world. Wait a minute. 
God wrote a book called the Holy Bible, and God says in Ecclesiastes 7.20, there is not one just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Jesus said in Luke 18, 19, none is good except one, that's God. I believe Jesus, how about you? Yeah. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned. Galatians 3, 22, the scripture, God's word, hath concluded all under sin. Let's believe God. Now, when one becomes born again, and 60 million Americans say, we're born again, the Bible tells us that the fruit of the new birth shows up in the daily life. The results of the new birth center around a theological term, regeneration. Have you ever wondered what that mystical term meant? It's found in Titus 3, 5, regeneration. Let me explain it simply. When two people get married, have an act of love, and a child is born through that act of love, both natures of the parents are found in that little child. And that is called human generation. When the little kid does wrong, mom says, boy, he's mean like his father. He's got his father's nature. He's a chip off the old block. And when the little girl is sweet and nice, and everything's wonderful and rosy, she says, my, she's like me. <laughs> now, here we have a child that has the nature of both parents, a father and mother, within that little body. That is human generation. Regeneration, a theological term, is when one gets born again, God's holy nature is imparted to the new believer. You don't believe that? 2 Peter 1, 4. We have become partakers of the divine nature. God comes in. And now God has many attributes, but among them I want to discuss two, holiness and love. God is holy, 1 Peter 1, 16. And when the Lord God comes and lives in human bodies, that holiness rubs off. We've got a lot of people who say, yeah, I'm born again, and they live like the devil. I want you to know that when one is born again, he begins to act differently, live differently, talk differently, walk differently, and even smell differently. Amen. There's a change. Romans 6, 4 says one is raised to newness of life. If you cannot find a new walk as you daily go through this world, something's wrong. That isn't bo being born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, not a church, not a denomination, in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Why? God has come in. God is holy. God's nature rubs off, just like the child has the two natures of the parents within it. That of mother and father, human generation, so regeneration is now God's nature entering a human body. And the holiness goes along with it. That's why 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says, God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. 2 Timothy 1, 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling. In 1 John, the third chapter, verse 9, it says, whosoever is, watch the terminology, born of God, he's got it, doth not practice sin. For his seed, the Holy Spirit, remaineth in him, and he cannot practice sin because he's born of God. I believe that a Christian can still commit sin, still do wrong. We're human beings. Oh, not me. I haven't sinned in 17 years, brother. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, we can do wrong. But a Christian cannot live in sin, love sin, enjoy sin, practice sin. Our churches are full of people saying, I'm born again. And they can out drink pirates. They can out curse the pirates' parrots. Everything goes. We've got drunkards, drug addicts, liars, thieves, those who practice fornication, adultery, every sin known sitting in our churches. Say, oh, I was born again. Once upon a time, I walked an aisle. I signed a card and sent my photograph for baptism. That settled it. Not so. The Bible says when one is born again, God's nature enters, and first of all, God is holy, and the holiness of God begins to transform and change the one in which the nature dwells. You have to be different. 
I've had people say, oh, come on. I know what it says back there in John. But I'm under grace, and the great grace preacher Paul says one can do anything. Do you know we've got so much grace around today, it's almost disgrace? But I've got news for you. I spent years memorizing the New Testament. I've memorized every word that the Apostle Paul wrote in the 14 epistles. And the great grace preacher repeatedly says that one cannot live in sin, love sin, enjoy sin, chase sin, practice sin, and end up in a sinless heaven. Paul, Paul. Now, may I go one step farther? I get tired of these preachers who say, well, John's legalistic, Paul is grace. Sure, I believe in dispensations. But also know that the Almighty God wrote all of the book and used different personalities when writing it. And Paul's message is the same as John's, both stating, you do not live a life of sin and meet God at the end of the road. Paul? Paul. Ephesians 5, 5, for this you know that no whoremonger, woman chaser, whore unclean person, one who's constantly telling smutty jokes. Context, verse 3. Whore the covetous man who's an idolater. He makes the dollar his God, and he'll do anything to get the dollar. He'll lie, steal, cheat. He'll mark up the prices and then give a discount. He'll use all kinds of crooked methods. He'll cheat on his income taxes. He'll cheat on his tithes to God. God says these three groups, women chasers, dirty storytellers, and money lovers, have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. None, none. I don't agree with you. Friend, your argument isn't with me. It's with God Almighty. He wrote it. I only quote it, but I believe it. Let Paul speak again in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Fornicators, those who practice premarital sex, Oh, but sir, we are having a trial marriage. I don't care what kind you're having. If it isn't legally bound in the eyes of God through a preacher or through a justice of the peace, you're living in sin and you can't meet God living in sin. Amen. Or adulterers, they come to the altar and say, till death do us part. And when the little girl gets to be 40 years of age, they try to trade her in for 220s. You know that crowd. Or the effeminate abusers of themselves with mankind, those who practice twisted, perverted sex. Idolaters, drunkards, railers, extortioners shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, we're living in a day and age when we're so promiscuous, even in religious circles. Anything goes anymore. The holiness of God is flaunted, but God is still on the throne. God is still holy. And when the holy nature of God Enter as a human being, he's changed. I'll never forget when Rexel and I were in Spain. She said, honey, I have to comb my hair a little more. And I said, I understand. It's 10 o'clock, we'll be back at 2. You know how it is. And as I'm walking up and down the corridors, I hear this American voice. What a thrill to hear an American in Spain. I rushed up to him, grabbed his hand, and said, are you an American? He said, ah, sure I am, partner. <laughs> I immediately detected that New Jersey accent. <laughs> I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, sir, I'm a GI station in Bordeaux, France. They've given me a three-week furlough, and I'm spending it here in Madrid. What a time. Whew, what a time. He said, last night, I got on one of these nightclub tours. I went from nightclub to nightclub, dance hall to dance hall, wine, women's song. My arms were filled with luscious gales. He said, sir, how would you like to live tonight? He said, you meet me out in front, I'll pay you away. And your arms will be filled with luscious girls, too. And the liquor will flow from your ears. I said, sir, I used to do that. For I was in nightclubs. My father was an entertainer. And I had religion when I was doing it. But then I met Jesus Christ. And the Lord came in. And the holiness of God took over. It rubbed off. And I was changed. I became a new creation. He turned white red, white red, white red. He says, B -b 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 -b. He says, you misunderstand, sir. He says, I happen to be a Baptist Sunday school teacher myself down yonder, Texas. Now, I can pick up my own denomination a little. I said, what are you doing in these places? He said, sir, I grew up in a Christian home and had never seen sin for myself. So how could I teach my Sunday school boys the exceeding sinfulness of sin when I'd never seen sin? 
So I'm just going to these places now with notebook, pencil, observing. <laughs> so that when I get home, I can really teach them what sin is. I thought, you old hypocrite. Before it was wine, women's song. Whew. Now he's just a note taker for a Sunday school class. <laughs> We've got a lot of people like that, but friend, hear it again. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, hatred, witchcraft, and a whole score of sins, 17. And when he ends it, he says, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, but sir, I've done these things. Ah, but Jesus Christ loves you. And he shed his precious blood for you. And the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. If you will come to that cross tonight and throw your sin on Jesus and ask him into your heart, he'll save you. You'll become born again. You'll become a son and daughter of God. He'll remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. He'll cast your sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, 19. And better than that, he'll forget that you ever committed any sins. For he says in Hebrews 8, 12, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The second and final attribute of God that I want to discuss is love. Not only is he holy, but he's love. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. When one becomes born again, remember that term, regeneration? He receives God's nature, holiness and love. I'm afraid that there are millions of people around the world who claim to be born again who aren't, for all they do is hate, hate everyone and anything. Our churches are full of people who are fighting, fussing, bickering. They're always criticizing, always gossiping, always running one another down. Something's wrong with that kind of Christianity. God is love, and when the God of love comes to dwell in a human body, the love also rubs off internally. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. I repeat it, he that loveth not knoweth not God. You can't hate everybody and everything and really be born again. The love of God in you makes that an impossibility. 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. 1 John 2, verses 9 to 11. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. This is God speaking through his word. Two groups, children of God and children of the devil. Who's who? Whosoever practiseth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, 1 John 4, 12. If a man say, I love God, but hate his brother, he's a liar. Ouch! The Holy Spirit said that in 1 John 4, 20. It's so easy to say, I love the Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus and hate everyone else in the community, and hate everyone in the neighborhood, and hate everyone at the church. If I were as bitter, filled with as much hatred as some of you who name the name of Jesus Christ are, I'd fall on my knees and examine myself to see whether I was really in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. You cannot be full of hate and be genuinely born again. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because you have love one for another. Who said that? Jesus, John 13, 35. Oh, we talk about the gifts. We talk about sacrifice. It's all meaningless if there's no love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge so that I can remove mountains, and have not love, I am nothing. Get ready for the shocker. Though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 4. Imagine 
Go to the bank, get out all your savings, distribute it to the poor, let them tie your body to the stake and burn you and die in defense of the faith. And he says, even that profits nothing when you meet Jesus if your heart was not filled with love for other Christians. I'll tell you, we need an old-fashioned revival in this country where the people of God will fall on their knees and ask God to forgive them for their gossip, for their hatred, for their malice, for the malignant spirit as they maliciously try to destroy one another. We need a revival of love in our nation, love in our homes, love in our churches. That's the proof we're saved. Holiness and love are the two attributes of God. And when God comes in, regeneration, those two attributes rub off. And I'm going to say it very dogmatically, ladies and gentlemen, if you cannot find either one of these two evidences in the life, something's wrong. If you're a Christian, don't ever touch the Lord's Supper if you've got bitterness in your heart toward the others. Don't partake of the Holy Communion. It's dangerous business. They came to the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 31. And God said, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, with unconfessed sin in the life, eateth and drinketh damnation to his body. Not the soul, that can't be done, but to the body. Because of it, many Christians are weak and sickly, and many sleep, many are prematurely buried. Now, what was one of the sins? Chapter 1, verse 11, It hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Psst, 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 fighting. 1 Corinthians 11, 17, There are divisions among you. Contentions, chapter 1. Divisions, chapter 17. Fighting, fussing, fuming, criticizing, gossiping. I'll tell you, our churches across the nation are full of people who are constantly at one another and they destroy ministers with their tongues, and they destroy one another. Are you really saved if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart? His religion is vain. You can go to prayer in a moment and bow your heads and say, do I really have it? To be born again is to receive Jesus Christ. It's that simple. I've proven it. And when one is born again, God's nature enters regeneration. God is holy. God is love. And I'm pleading with you in the name of Christ. I'm pleading you with you in the name of your never dying soul within your body. It's going to live forever and forever and forever somewhere. Be sure you're saved. How? First of all, do you have the evidence of holiness in your daily walk? Secondly, do you have the evidence of love? I'm going to ask you now, as you bow your heads with me, to ask God to save you, that you might have a born-again experience this very moment, and that these things will become true, perhaps for the first time in your life. If you cannot find holy living and love filling the heart, do something about it right now, will you? Let's pray. Father. We ask that the Holy Spirit of God may take the words of God and apply them to our hearts. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you right this moment to receive Jesus Christ. Right in the quietness of this moment, will you pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me now. I trust in your shed blood. The moment one does that, he becomes a son or daughter of God, becomes born again. Will you who are Christians who have walked away from God, you're not living for Him. You cannot find this love. You're not what you once were. Pray this, Lord, I'm coming home. I'm coming back. I've wandered far from you. Come on, take time to pray. Think seriously. This has been a strong Bible message. I make no apologies for it. It's the Word of God. And the proof that you are saved is the way you live now that you're saved. You are now living a holy life. The things of the world are gone. You're sick of it all. And now the love of God is filling you, and you love other Christians. There's a change. If you don't have it, get saved now. Receive Jesus now. Come back to God now. Father, meet the needs in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please.
I'm going to ask that as the choir sings just as I am, that everyone who wants to receive Christ, everyone who wants to get right with God, you say, Sir, my heart isn't in tune with what you've preached tonight. I need to get an experience. I need the real thing. I need to get born again. I need to get right with God. I'm a backslider. I'm going to ask you to come down these aisles. Christian, talk to loved ones and bring them. Will you begin to move to the front? Come here and stand in front for a word of prayer. If God has spoken, begin to move out from everywhere. Come on. Bring someone with you. Husband and wife, talk it over and come arm in arm. Oh, come from every area of the building. I want Christ. I want to be born again. I want to live for God again. Come on, move out. Fathers, mothers, whole families. Teenager, come on, God's speaking to you. As the choir continues singing, will you come? Come on, God is speaking. I'm talking to you now there by your home set. Are you born again? Do you have the fruit of salvation? Does that holy living appear in your daily life? Does the love of God manifest itself in your daily walk? My heart's burdened. I've preached with all the vim, with all the fullness of the Spirit I could feel tonight in my heart. I'm concerned about you. I want you to bow your head by that set right now and receive Jesus or get right with God. Will you bow the head with me? Let's pray together. Father, for the many listening now by television, may this be the moment when they too will receive Jesus. We'll get right with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that you've made this decision, either to be saved, to become born again, or to get right with God, will you write us?